So good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining this evening for the seventh in our menopause series, Restless Presents, with our partners, My Menopause Center. So on this occasion, we're looking at menopause in the workplace. So before I hand over to Helen, who will chair this evening's event, I wanted to remind you of a couple of housekeeping points. Uh, please post your questions and thoughts in the chat function at the bottom of your screens. Feel free to post throughout the presentation. There will also be time for questions at the end. This event is being recorded um, and will be mailed to all of those who have registered for the evening, along with links to other resources. It will also be available to view on our YouTube channel, uh, as well as within the menopause section of, um, of Restless. So I'd like to hand over now to our panel chair, Helen Normoyle, who is co-founder of My Menopause Centre. Helen has held chief marketing officer roles across the healthcare, beauty, broadcast, furniture and property sectors, and is a self-described women's wellness champion. Over to you, Helen. Thank you very much, Claire, and welcome everybody to this evening's event. Well, as you will have seen in our invitation, a staggering one million women are poised to quit their jobs here in the UK, following the 900,000 who have already left their jobs because of a lack of menopause support, and 63% of companies still don't have a menopause policy in place. The consequence of this lack of support? It's estimated that in the UK alone, an estimated 14 million workdays are lost every year due to menopause symptoms. And with menopause mainly affecting those in their late 40s and early 50s, too many women are leaving work at the peak of their careers, stepping back from promotion or reducing their hours, not because they want to, but because they feel they need to, exacerbating the pension and the gender pay gap, weakening gender diversity and doing nothing to attract and retain this brilliant talent. It's no wonder then that menopause has fast become one of the most important and topical issues facing businesses today, with growing recognition that the impact it has on female talent retention and mental health can no longer be underestimated or overlooked and the taboo must go. So we're delighted to be joined this evening by three brilliant women and experts in their respective areas. Dr. Claire Spencer from My Menopause Centre, Deborah Garlick from Henpick Menopause in the Workplace, and Kate Hess from Cognomi. Dr. Claire, as I mentioned, is co-founder of My Menopause Centre and clinical director of our online clinic. And Dr. Claire is passionate about educating, empowering and supporting all women through all stages of their menopause transition. Deborah is the CEO of Menopause in the Workplace and author of the book, Menopause, The Change for the Better. Deborah was one of the first women to put herself out there in this field and to fly the flag for menopausal women. Her brilliant organization, Menopause in the Work Team, supports employers to achieve menopause-friendly accreditation by an independent panel making a real difference to the support that's provided for women in the workplace. Kate Hess is the brilliant co-founder, Chief People Officer and Head of Coaching at Cognomi. Kate's also the organization's subject matter expert on mental fitness, particularly relevant for World Menopause Day as the theme this year is, is uh, mood and cognition. So Cognomi has a vision to bring mental fitness development to people wherever they are around the world and they have hundreds of coaches globally and many who specialize in supporting women through the menopause as well. So as, AD, as Claire said, please put your questions into the chat. We've had a few that were submitted in advance and we'll get to them through the course of the conversation. Now, Deborah, with that, let's start off with a question for you. As I mentioned, you've been involved in menopause workplace training and education for the past five to six years. Why do you think that menopause is so topical now? even compared to two three, two, three years ago, given it's something that women have always experienced. So what's changed? Well, in, indeed, Helen, because all of those statistics you were quoting, and there were some really alarming statistics in there, and we're still learning more every day about the impact, not just for, for, for us as women, but also for organisations. And I'll probably, when I, when I hear those statistics about those that potentially leaving the organization. Um, I often think about those that were perhaps a little bit more like me, that were the quiet leavers as well, that will never show up on any statistics. 
Um, so why are we talking about it more now? Because as you say, as long as there have been women on this earth and as long as they've lived long enough, there's been the menopause. But we are in a different time. And I think we're the first generation to be in the where we are right now. And that is that we're living for longer. We're working for longer. There are more women that are in senior positions, more women in work than ever before. And um, and that has a that has an impact. We have to take that into account. And I know um, Dr. Claire will probably be able to tell us these statistics a little bit more. But if we go back in time to around about 100 years ago, without going into the statistics, menopause was something we tended to experience towards the end of our lives. Um, but now when you appreciate that we um, could be work, we, we could live or we expect to live until our uh, mid 80s, we stand a one in six or one in seven chance of living to be 100. Um, with the average menopause age of 51, menopause is towards the middle of our lives. And when you appreciate that that's where that is, and we might be working until our 60s, actually somebody, one of the HR professionals was saying, some of us may never retire. Um, you, you have to appreciate then that it's hitting at a, an important part of our careers. Um, and I think there's much more understanding not, not completely across the UK, but there's a lot more employers that appreciate that they can make a difference to their workplace, whether that's diversity and inclusion, wanting to create an inclusive environment where everybody can be at their best or appreciating their responsibility for the wellness of the people in their organisation. Um, there are some amazing statistics as well that do blow my mind around the business case on this one, some that you've mentioned around um, the cost of losing talent in your organization is being much more appreciated. Um, the potential for um, employment law, uh, the risk of employment law uh, breaches with tribunals are on the increase. And as you said, we'll come back to that later. Um, but actually from my experience, the employers that are doing this now are the ones because it's the, the think this is the right thing to do. Um, they are recognizing that menopause doesn't go on forever. And if somebody hits a bump in the road during their menopause and they look after that individual, they're there for them, they know how to provide the right support. Then actually after that period and when they've got the symptoms under control and um, they can continue in that role. And to be fair, when you know your employer gets you, when you know your employer is there for you, if, if you need them, you're much more likely to um, be loyal to that employer, aren't you? So for me, there's a, there's a big element on that. And um, so looking back on how this has progressed around about six years ago, we couldn't find an employer in the UK um, that had a menopause policy. Around about 2000, well, it was 2019, CIPD said that one in 10 employers have something in place. And uh, last month, uh, the CIPD said it was around about 30% um, that had actually started to take action. Now, for me, um, there's taking action and there's taking action. Um, at my experience is there's no point in having a menopause policy if you're not, not going to use it, if you're going to file it away. What we see where employers do this really, really well is they put all of the things in place that are important to bringing it to life and changing the lived experience. Um, so it's a very compelling reason. And of course, you know, I don't think a day goes by without uh, another celebrity talking about their menopause. Um, and I think that's great. You know, I think the um, the moment Yasmin Le Bon said, this is my, my experience of menopause. And I was thinking, well, you know, I used to follow her when um, uh, when D Duran Duran was all the craze. And if she can have a menopause, it's all right for me to. Um, so we're seeing it much more in the media. It's becoming much more common parlance. Um, so and that's good for us all, isn't it? Oh, it's brilliant, as you say, Deborah. It, it really, you know, helps us to normalize the conversation, but also recognize that as we've discussed previously, we're still really at the, at the foothills. And I suppose having some brilliant female parliamentarians who are um, flying the flag for um, the right changes and, and, and support for women is really helping uh, as well. Um, so Dr. Claire, uh, you have, you're hugely experienced in supporting women as they go through the menopause transition. And you've seen 
and helped thousands. In your experience, with all of the work that you do in the clinic, what do you see as the symptoms of menopause that most impact women at work? Yeah, thanks, Helen. Um, so I think really any symptom of the menopause can have an impact on a woman's ability to function as she wants to at work. And when we think of the scope of symptoms on our website, we list 40 you know, reflecting how important estrogen is around our body. And it's that fluctuation and drop of estrogen that is responsible for a whole host of physical, psychological, cognitive symptoms, as well as those related to sex. And I think the ones I hear about most are the symptoms relate to cognition. So that's sort of how our brain functions. It's our awareness. So brain fog, that feeling of having a brain full of cotton wool when you're trying to concentrate, lack of focus, memory issues, word finding issues, um, that really poor concentration when you've got a list of tasks to do, or, um, you know, women will say they, they've got to stand up, give a presentation, and it's just, ah, the word has gone from their head. Um, Mood-related symptoms also have a knock-on effect. So anxiety, so worrying about all of the above, as well as anxiety as a standalone symptom. And low mood as well, that sort of lack of motivation, lack of excitement, feeling like you're trying to wade through concrete when you've got a whole huge list of tasks to do. And then all of this impacting on loss of confidence as well. And, you know, hot flushes, yes. Women tell me they feel embarrassed sitting in a room of men or younger people, men or women, and the embarrassment that they feel, that feeling of dread. And we know physiologically because what happens with hormones when you have that sense of dread and anxiety that can then just all act to compound and make the hot flush worse poor sleep has an impact on everything so just in terms of impact you, you can imagine that this from, from you know the shop floor from the factory floor to management to directors and beyond the impact is really quite huge. I mean, Helen, we went to the DFS factory, didn't we? And, you know, women having aches and pains, which is a really common first symptom of the menopause at the beginning of the transition, although you can experience it all the way through, you know, well, lugging sofas from one bit of a factory to another, you know, that would have a really significant impact where for somebody else who's number crunching, say, it, it's more of the cognitive symptoms that have an effect. So it completely depends. The impact will depend on so many factors. But I think the take home message also is the knock on effect of one symptom on other symptoms, just compounding without the right support, without being able to talk about it and trying to suppress symptoms, um, then having an impact in making those symptoms worse as well. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Clare. Um, th th that's super helpful. And, and Kate, Dr. Clare has called out the impact of menopause symptoms on both mood and cognitive function and how you know, symptoms combined can result in a loss of confidence and self-esteem in the workplace and, and be really quite stressful. And we've had a, a question in here um, from, from Julia, and thank you very much, Julia, uh, who's, who's talking about the impact of this. And Judy, we will come back to your questions um, towards the end of the session in the Q&A. Um, but Kate, in your experience, what advice would you give to, to people who are really feeling that loss of confidence and self-esteem at work and really getting quite stressed over how they manage their symptoms. Yeah, it's so overwhelming, isn't it? So many things that impact individuals and women going through menopause. We've heard so many examples there and it is complex, over 40 symptoms, as, as Dr. Claire said, listed as, as menopause symptoms. So understanding ourselves as individuals is the first step. So understanding that we're all different as individuals as well and, and focusing on building our own self-awareness of what might be going on for us or for the individual. So that requires us to pause for a while to make some space, perhaps to do some um, self-profiling, self-perception analysis to understand ourselves better, to also um, draw apart how much of what we're experiencing is menopause and, and much of it will be. And also, we've all just come through a pandemic. There's many other world crises hitting us. So sometimes if we tease out what the cause is, 
uh, it's where we can then isolate, you know, how much of it is menopause. And therefore, what would I do about the physical symptoms and where do I go to, to support those? But then when we're looking at the more psychological symptoms, as you mentioned, so cognition and mood being very importantly part of that as well, but also confidence, as you've said, um, the, the opportunity to understand ourselves and have the choice around that, creating space, space to understand ourselves and to, to then take a personalized approach to being able to work with this. And, and organizations that appreciate that one size fits one, not one size fits all, uh, is, is how the individual women and men supporting women through menopause can really benefit. So, so taking that personalized approach, creating space to enable ourselves to understand ourselves as individuals, uh, and then working out what choices individuals have. So whether that is going down a medical route or creating space for perhaps some more psychological support through coaching, as an example, or through peer support uh, with others in the organization. That, that's great, Kate, uh, and, and really helpful to, I suppose, put it in that context. And Deborah, before I come back to you, just a quick question back to Dr. Claire. I, I know one of the things you said to me, which I find incredibly helpful is, it's 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 not you it's your hormones Helen you know that that's what's driving all the changes so mm. in, in terms of the advice that you would give to people you see patients that you see as well Claire to, to kind of give some context to what they're experiencing and the angst around perceived poor performance mm. yeah no I, I think that, that that's a really important part of it as well particularly bound up in the loss of confidence um, because often women think that they're past their shelf life, that they're not able to function, that they've lost ability. They've, irre they've irreversibly lost abilities to be able to function, juggle, you know, all of those really important ways then that our brains get us through when that particularly if we're juggling jobs, children, parents etc and and often you can see there's visible relief you can see the shoulders sometimes drop when you say look this is not you this is not your personal failing this is the effect of hormones and changes in hormones on your brain that we can do something about and often there's a big um a load of anxiety tied up in the worry about early dementia which we know the diagnosis of early dementia under the age of 65 is incredibly rare. So around 0.01% um, chance of um, being diagnosed with dementia under the age of 65. And again, that can take some of the worry off as well. So I think that is a, I don't know what um, Kate and Deborah think, but from where I sit, that's a big part of the worry. And so that, you know, the, 8% of women who don't go for promotion, and that's only the 8% that we know about, as you said, Deborah, that it's the silent, um, you don't hear the women who haven't gone for the next job because they don't think they're capable. They haven't, they don't think they've got it in them anymore. That is so sad to hear, as well as the women losing jobs, taking time off sick, et cetera. There's a huge issue around quietly quitting. So we move yeah. from the great resignation to, to quietly quitting and, and people, women going through menopause, languishing in a role and slowly drifting away. And, and you made the, the comment, Claire, about performance. So when organizations are ignoring the importance of supporting women through menopause, they're, they're ignoring the possibility of improving and maintaining organizational mm. performance and making that link is, is really important. Yes, no, no. And we've all heard stories of women who've been managed out of their jobs, who might have an annual medical, who might complain of some menopause symptoms at that annual medical and find themselves just being legally managed out of a role which is dreadful it's awful isn't it when you think about it it's all due to a phys physiological change which can get better yeah and that's yeah. actually a really good segue into to deborah um you know we we've we, we'll come to in a moment all the things that employers can do and the benefits of, of providing the, the support and if we think about it though in terms of carrots and sticks they're the carrots the positive incentives but of course, we, 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 there are legal 
uh, there's a legal framework and there are certain protections in the law and there's a, a desire to enhance those. And it's one of the questions that's come in in the chat. Deborah, can you give us an overview in terms of, you know, what legal protections are there today? And then, you know, maybe your thoughts on the increase in the number of tribunals, the number is still small, but the increase in the number of tribunals that we're seeing in yeah. that are menopause related. Yeah, sure, because, you know, it, it is an important one. And I love the, the, the carrot and stick because I mentioned that the best employers are the ones that are putting things in place that support the colleagues so they don't get that overwhelmed feeling that Kate um, talked about and, and, you know, helping people understand you're not alone because so many times we hear people saying, I thought it was just me. And I heard this, this quote the other day where a woman said, um, uh, she, she was saying, I wish people knew me before the menopause hit. And I just thought, I was so sad because, you know, for her, she was high performing and now she was in the absolute doldrums of her, her um, confidence. But menopause is actually already covered by employment law. It's covered by the Equalities Act 2010 under um, three protected characteristics, age, sex, and even disability. So whilst menopause in itself is not a disability, the symptoms can be so severe and get in the way um, for such a long time that it can be classed as such under the Equality Act as a disability. Um, so that is the key legislation that, um, that protects us. Um, and of course, it's now with the Women's Equality Committee, I might have got that, um, that's right, isn't it? Women's Equality um, Select Committee that have been doing their investigations and be, been hearing evidence um, to consider if um, that is protection enough. We don't know yet what the outcome of that is, but, you know, I'm kind of in the place of, I'm hoping that menopause becomes the 10th protected characteristic just as um, pregnancy and maternity is, it makes sense for that to happen. Um, and if it does, I think what we can potentially, well, we will potentially see is an even bigger rise in tribunals, um, because one of the um, challenges of menopause not being a protected characteristic at the moment, from my understanding of working with our employment lawyer, is when things do go to tribunal and they're saying, well, is it age or is it sex or is it disability? Doesn't really tick all of those boxes. So, um, you know, that's getting in the way of um, uh, clarity. Whereas if the 10th protected characteristic of menopause comes in, I think we'll see an even greater number going through. Um, so it is covered. Um, it's also covered under the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974. There are responsibilities of an employer under that act too. Um, and you're right, uh, Helen, the, 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 the tribunals are currently on the rise. And I know I've seen headlines that say a, a dramatic increase, the seismic increase in the number, it's still a small number relatively um, to all of that. But I, I think what's more important is what when you look at the um, stories under the case laws, um, and, and actually they are public, so you can read um, those case studies. Uh, and what we tend to see as a red thread going through them all is I would say the red threads are where the employer has not understood that menopause is something that could affect people and hopefully that's starting to change. Uh, another one is um, uniqueness. We are all unique in our journey and I know the very, very first um, tribunal was on the basis or was one on the basis that um, a male line manager said, uh, I don't believe that because my wife had the menopause and she had none of that. So that was going way back then. And um, there's also some things about inappropriate banter and humour around menopause um, that's come through on the tribunals. And probably if you start to put that all together, it comes down to a general lack of education around the menopause and how it can affect someone. And just as importantly, what would help if a colleague or a member of your team is experiencing the menopause, what can you do to help them through that stage? And, and I'm going to, I might sort of, um, I'm very mindful, we do a lot of training with line managers and they can very often come into the sessions 
feeling a little bit fearful. Um, we tend to run a poll at the beginning that says, what's your level of knowledge and what's your level of confidence? And it's right down here because they're part, they, they see the myths, they hear those too. And generally they'll say, well, I don't know what I don't know. So how do I get to that point? And, you know, just some general education around the ages, stages, symptoms, what's helpful during this time and how to have a good conversation can really change that picture. But that is something I would say is fundamental, making sure that we don't just criticise line managers for not knowing. They're not born with menopause knowledge. They're part of um, the national lack of education about menopause generally. Um, so I would say that is absolutely key um, as part of the next phase, if we like, if we want to crack this cultural problem for good, I would say uh, education and awareness are absolutely key throughout. Yeah, and Deborah, you, you touched on a really important point there in one of the examples that you gave where you said the, 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 the line manager or, or boss in the company said that, well, my wife didn't experience that in the menopause, therefore it can't be true and that we know that. Uh, you know, every woman's experience of menopause is different. And I think particularly important maybe for women to not project their own menopause experience onto other women. There's a comment in here. Uh, thank you, Vanessa, saying the only thing worse than a male boss who doesn't understand is a woman boss who thinks the menopause is a work of fiction. Because if you're one of the lucky one in five who doesn't experience any symptoms, you might presume that other people who talk about symptoms are, are, are exaggerating. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and so, um, Deborah, question for you then, and then we'll open it up to, to Claire and Kate. So Kate, Kate and Claire, uh, Dr. Claire jump in then. You, you're, you're, you've set up menopause in the workplace to really help ide uh, employers identify what they can do to really create an environment where women of all ages can thrive. Um, so based on your experience, What's the best practice or the things that organisations can do to support women going through the menopause in the workplace? What we see um, with those that are really demonstrating that they are changing the lived experience of not just women, but and Kate mentioned it earlier, but also those around them. Um, you know, because ha we have to start from the perspective of this doesn't affect half the population. It affects all of the population, half of us firsthand, the other half through our relationship. So it's key that everybody is involved in this. And I mentioned the training earlier and I, you know, I, I'm a big advocate for training. Um, but what we tend to see is where they do create that environment, organizations create the environment where you can say menopause without feeling worried about what somebody's gonna think about you or um, is gonna judge you on that, or you mentioned it earlier, is not going to uh, put you forward for that promotion or you know, pigeonhole you as, well, that's you going out towards um, to retirement then, is it? Because of lack of understanding of when it happens. So creating that environment where you've got that safety and, what, they, what organizations do, which I think is particularly good, is when um, they get senior stakeholders involved in that conversation. Because, you know, I'm thinking of an NHS organization and the CAO was female and she opened up a conference, a menopause conference around um, by saying, um, I'm experiencing hot flushes. I've got brain fog. I feel ter terribly fat today. And as soon as she said that, you could see there was a sigh of relief in the audience, because if the boss can feel like that and she's performing at that level, then it's OK for me to start to say, actually, I'm not feeling great today myself either or bear with me. Um, I've got Wi-Fi connection issues at the moment. That's what I call my brain fog, Claire. Um, so, you know, when you when that, that kind of gives everybody permission to talk about it. So creating that environment and also um, one that I saw recently, the storytelling. Um, we said earlier that knowing you're not on your own is important in all of this and sharing stories of colleagues of some that you might know, some at different ages, um, colleagues that might be supporting someone. So really, really um, getting the messages out there. Um, also, policies and guidance documents. Now, they're not law yet, 
um, but they may well soon be law. So I would say a really good policy and guidance document is key. Very often, and this has happened to me so many times where somebody says, we do nothing in our organisation. And then they tell me who they work for. And I say, well, actually, I know you've got a policy. I've seen it. Um, and, you know, maybe they were on holiday or didn't know it was there. Maybe it's not as accessible. It's not being communicated. Um, but those documents are really helpful, even if they're just high level documents and give the key messages around why it's important in the organisation, the key facts. This is these are the resources that are available to you in this organisation. You know, very often, all, well, most organisations have a, an in a EAP provider or occupational health or counselling sessions and all of those sort of things that you can tap into. So they tend to be in a guidance document. But as I say, the key for that is that it's easily accessible. Think about the individual that's experiencing this for the first time. Can they get their hands on it quickly? Or the line manager that says, um, or has a, a meeting in their diary that says, I want to talk to you about my menopause and they look like a rabbit in the headlight. If they can get their hands on it to understand what their role is in all of this, then that's very, very helpful. Um, so that's the sort of the um, engagement and the cultural and also the guidance document. I mentioned the training earlier, but one that we're seeing more and more is where the organisations take taken the extra step and said, let's look at our environment at work and asking really powerful questions, which don't sound very powerful, but they really are. They'll say to colleagues, what's getting in the way of you being at your best at work? And an example I would give is um, an employer that went for accreditation, menopause friendly accreditation. And um, they had a work uniform and the panel said, and is it menopause friendly? Have you looked at it? And they said, we've had no complaints about it. Now, no complaints isn't the same as it's a nice or it's a comfortable uniform to wear. So when they went back and asked their colleagues, the feedback was, yeah, it's a nightmare. I feel like I'm, I'm in a boil in the bag whenever I have a hot flush. It's really uncomfortable. So asking those questions and saying, what's getting in the way? And also, what would help you? during this time. And then our organisations are taking action on that. I mean, we've seen Boots offering um, HRT to their colleagues, free HRT prescriptions. Um, we've seen some organisations offering doctor's appointments, specialist menopause doctor's appointments. So really are going that extra mile with that. Not all organisations will do that, of course, but more and more are saying those or asking those important questions. But when I'm saying all of this about um, doing all of these things, and I know certainly from experience that when we're training line managers and we start to talk to them about what work adjustments could you make if somebody was experiencing this symptom or this symptom or this symptom, um, what we found from that is actually the, the workplace adjustments are usually very little cost and not in place forever. You know, it's very easy for employers to do. So there's some of the key elements that people can put in place or organisations can put in place. Brilliant. Thank you, Deborah. And, and Kate, based on your experience in, in, in coaching, so building in what Deborah said about, you know, brilliant tips about creating the right culture and adjustments. What are your thoughts on, you know, what would your advice be to, to help women reframe the menopause? Because often, when you know, women realise they're going through the menopause and come with a lot of negative baggage. So what would your thoughts and tips be? Mm. So I think they come at a, a couple of different perspectives. Certainly there's, there's something for the organisation to consider culturally, which I'll come back to, uh, and which we're, we're drawing on already there. But, but most definitely encouraging a woman to explore for herself a better understanding of who she is, a better understanding of what's going on for her physiologically, uh, psychologically as well. So understanding ourselves better is the first step. Going back to the point about uh, getting a holistic picture of what's happening for us, you know, what we're thinking, what we're feeling, uh, where that's coming from, but also creating some capacity to do something about that. So self-understanding, self-awareness and insight and whatever way we can do that through a, um, a self-profiling questionnaire is the way that we would do that to help someone understand themselves 
better. So that's at the level of the individual. And that there's such a lot that uh, building on everything that Deborah has said there that an organization can do that goes beyond this being about menopause. This is about leadership. This is about culture. This is about the way that humans interact with each other and the way that we help people perform to be at their best. So when we recognize that there's a cultural perspective here and when we think more about bringing compassion into the workplace around menopause, but around any aspect of, of performance or, or human uh, interaction between managers and individuals, um, if we start to think about compassion, then we start to break down some of these barriers. You know, the woman boss who doesn't see menopause as an important issue because she hasn't had it. The uh, the organisation that doesn't give enough space to people to understand who they really are and everybody's leading to burnout. So, so it's a cultural perspective around giving people space to understand themselves better and then giving them support to help them choose what they can do with that. So do I need to, to go and see the GP and get HRT? And when I've done that, how can I then sustain the awareness of, of helping me build my confidence back or my courage back? And that's where an individual supportive thinking partner, such as a coach, will also really help. Brilliant. And Dr. Claire, um, you're probably the best listener that I know. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and we hear that from all of your patients as well. Um, and Kate touched upon compassion and listening. Mm -hmm. Based on your experience, um, and, and the patients that you see, what are the adjustments that are made in the workplace or what have you seen be most effective in supporting women in the workplace? Yeah, no. And before I answer that, Kate, um, Hannah, Kate, you made a really good point there because I often see if I'm following women up when we've started HRT, the HRT might have sorted the symptoms but then it's almost relearning how to be again, isn't it? You know, sometimes I suggest talking therapies or coaching or cognitive behavioral therapy, what, you know, whatever it is to try and get people. But it's something to do with the confidence, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Your confidence has been bashed on the head. Mm -hmm. And the HRT is great at taking you some of the way, but if you're still anxious about not being able to perform, it won't eradicate all the brain fog. It won't turn around that confidence often. HRT is a brilliant springboard, but you still need to spring. And sometimes you need somebody like Kate, I think, to help you spring back to where you want to be. So I think that's a really good point that's not often made. Thank you. And it's the transition, isn't it? So it's mm. enabling yourself into the next positive transition of life. So rather than let's treat it, let's solve it, let's sort it out. And that's it. This is about, OK, how do we embrace the next phase of life as we move through the positive transition that's menopause? So it is about continuing that self-conversation as well. Yes, no, no, I absolutely agree. And so to so to answer Helen's question, and it sort of is part of that, isn't it? it? It is women being able to work in an environment, I think, where there is an anxiety about suppressing feelings, symptoms, you know, what's going on. Some women don't want to talk about it, and that's completely fine. They'll just quietly go off, sort it out and and carry on and not need or want to involve work. But I think, you know, we were asked um, we were asked in one workplace we went to by a man who was he, he expressed anxiety, didn't he, about um, asking the question and really worried about pressing a button and triggering an explosion, I think, is what the worry was. But it is all about listening. It's telling managers or colleagues that all they actually do need to do is listen, because by allowing somebody to speak and express their symptoms, you diminish a load of that anxiety. I think anxiety has such a huge part to play in what's going on for so many women. Um, so, yeah, that, that would be what I would say. It's that list. It is the listening in a 45 minute appointment. I will generally listen for 20 minutes. And and that's often what's needed. You know, the story has to come out. And I think that's why so many of the workplace menopause cafes, um, menopause hubs and menopause meetups, whatever it is, it's just allowing people to just get it all out there. Um, if they want to, and and that's very relieving and soothing. 
Brilliant. So uh, as we kind of come into the last 10 minutes, I'm just going to uh, put to you some of the, the questions um, that have come in in advance. And, that, and there's a couple here in the chat. And if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the chat now. So we, we got a, a, an email from um, Vanessa. So thank you, Vanessa. So, and if I cut to the chase, so what's your advice for somebody who's been told by her GP that the menopause isn't a reason to be off work, unbelievably, and who basically has an employer that doesn't really care about what she's going through and her symptoms. Um, so that's clearly a, a really, really tough position mm -hmm. to be in, and we're really sorry to, to hear that. So Claire, if I start with you to maybe share your thoughts and advice yeah. on what you can do, and then I'll yeah. come to, to, to Kate and Deborah for, for your thoughts. Yeah, no, I would go back to the GP practice. That's wrong. You know, the, the menopause, if you are suffering with menopause symptoms and cannot work and need some time off and the GP says no, you know, GPs aren't there. I'm a GP, so I can say this to sit and I don't believe it's my job to make a judgment. I, my job is to facilitate and help and support. And if that GP was unhelpful, try a different GP, ask at reception who the menopause friendly GP is, because usually there's a GP in every practice now who has more knowledge of the menopause. I would I would go back and have the confidence to go back, even if you're feeling grim and stressed. Thank you, Claire. So, um, Kate, um, your, your, your thoughts and, and, and advice for someone who's just not getting anywhere at work? Yeah, I'd build on on what Claire said there around finding a trying to find a way to build courage and confidence. We've talked so much about that in this session, uh, and it's easy to say, not so easy to do. But to be able to find that that agency to be able to have the conversation again, or to make the choices about what else you want to do. So it often comes back to courage and confidence, and sometimes we can do that for ourselves. Um, by self-reflection and, and, and building some more self-compassion and self-care. And sometimes we need to find someone to support us with that. So that could be through someone else going through something similar. There are places you can reach out to, um, just talking to friends, being more open with friends and hearing from other people what they're going through. Normalizing the experience, shared experience with others will help a lot there. And if you can, get access to, to a coach who can help you think it through and create that um, capability, that capacity, that agency to have the conversations that perhaps you've been feeling uncomfortable or lacking in confidence to have. Um, and I really recognize it's easy to say and not always easy to do, but there is support there if you start to open up in conversations with others, I would suggest. And, and then Deborah, I'm sure unfortunately this isn't the first time that you've heard it, but what would your advice be? Well, I'm going to I'm going to go with the word prep, um, because actually I think that is key and fundamental to some of these conversations, whether it's with your GP or whether it's with your line manager. And Claire, uh, Kate said right at the beginning, um, understanding what's going on for you right now is so important because, you know, some days you can feel good and some days you're not. And then you've got this symptom and you've got that symptom. So I would always say um, keep a diary of your symptoms. Download the My Menopause Symptom uh, Center symptom check, check them and, and keep a note in your diary. Um, maybe you'll even be able to identify when some of your symptoms are worse than others and might be able to identify some triggers. But nevertheless, um, do map out your symptoms. And I would say read up from reputable resources about this. We see a lot of the myths and a lot of the um, things that aren't necessarily that accurate in the media. So go to my menopause centre, women's health concern and read up on the facts. And, and while you're doing that, start to get an idea of actually what do you think might be right for you? Um, because the next thing is to start um, using that prep to if you're going to make an appointment with your GP, as Claire said, ask who in the practice is the best person to talk to. And, and hopefully you have got a line manager and give them a heads up and say, I'd like to talk to you about my menopause and perhaps um, try and find a private meeting room so you're not interrupted during that time. And use that prep that you've done. So the structure of your conversation, because actually this is something that I think can help us all feel more co um, confident in the conversation. Then it would be, I want to talk to you about my menopause. These are my symptoms. 
This is how they're affecting me at work if you're talking to your line manager. This is what I'm doing about it if you're talking to your line manager or saying to your GP, actually, I've been reading up about HRT, I'd like to try it, or have you got any thoughts on this one based on my medical history? And, you know, give, give them time, particularly if it's line manager, to digest all of that. You know, you, this might have been something that's been on your mind for a very long time, and they might, it might be the first time somebody said the word menopause to them. So if you're doing that prep, you're setting up yourself for a much better conversation. And as Claire said, if you if you don't get the right outcome from your own GP or from the one that um, you had the appointment with, ask for a second opinion. Uh, I know that means ringing on a, a day and hoping you get somebody different for some, some of the practices, but you can escalate it in that way. And if it's your line manager that you don't get the support from, then I'm pretty sure that somebody in HR would be very interested in hearing about your experience. But yeah, for me, prep is key in this because it, it just enables you to, to have a much better conversation. Yeah, and there's a, a related question, and I suspect it might be a similar response from you all, but from somebody who said that she has an annual competency-based review, um, which is more a test of memory and recall than it is of performance, and which is clearly very stressful if you're suffering from from brain fog. Yeah. So again, any tips or advice to help her? Gosh, that's really tough. I've never heard of that happening before. That's really tough. I think you have to acknowledge, as a doctor, I would acknowledge what's happening. I would, you know, we've mentioned, so we, we um, developed a menopause questionnaire, which takes you through lots of symptoms and gives you an explanation, tells you where you are potentially in the menopause transition. But I don't know whether it's helpful to take that with you to say, this is what's happening, that this is why, and actually this is making me really quite anxious. From a from a human and a doctor point of view, I think that's really tough. I'm interested to hear what Kate and Deborah think about that. And so the question says, what can employers do to make in interviews uh, more menopause friendly? And I, and I think if you can have some um, shape the way that interviews are, are conducted so that they don't become uh in that way competency focused so that individuals mm. can't show their individual strengths um so it's a cultural perspective there so mm. if you can influence it at the cultural level you know through hr into the interview process fantastic create some awareness there if you're the interviewee and the person that's that's wanting to to share honestly what's going on for you as you're suggesting claire and that would be ideal wouldn't it to express mm. You know, this is this is me and this is what happening for me. I imagine like others, um, I'm, I'm thinking, well, some cultures might not deal terribly well with that. And, you know, we come back to the whole piece around fear and, and the stigmatization. So maybe it's about picking the organization as well based on the culture. Um, mm. but yeah, that does need to change, doesn't it? I would probably go with employment law, because I think also that if there is a policy that discriminates against an individual company-wide, which, you know, in many organizations, you know, if you look at the NHS, that's 77% female, then I think there's an open for challenge that, uh, you know, if, yeah. if you're experiencing menopause and Claire, you've said it before, cognition and mood are the symptoms that, cognition in particular, are the symptoms that women say affect the most in the workplace, yet it appears that there's a policy here that says that you've got to do something that menopausal women find more difficult during this time. I think I'd be up for challenging that one myself. I mm. like the feistiness, De Deborah. It's coming through the line. Um, <laughs> and then a, a good, good, good comment in here. Um, uh, Cat's eye, love the name. Um, some companies give questions in advance so as to reduce anxiety. So again, making the point that that you're uh, that you're all making about making the um, adjustments. Um, Claire, last very quick question for you before we wrap up and I hand back to uh, from Dr. Claire to Claire. Um, I know there's a book that you recommend on CBT that can be really, really helpful. Um, can you remember that? Sorry, I've put you totally on the spot. No, no, I can't I remember it. the name of it. Oh, brilliant. Um, because I think um, we, we've had some a request for advice on treatment options. And, and unfortunately, we, we can't go into that level of detail on, on a call like this. 
Awesome. But Emma's given you the link on the website. Claire, do you want to just talk briefly about this book and then we'll... Yes, yeah, no, really briefly, Myra Hunter is a professor who did a lot of work on CBT for breast cancer sufferers. But this little book is a non-wiffly waffly practical to the point there's a theme guide on um why you're having symptoms and how to think them through and how those vicious cycles get set up i know psychologists i know there are different types of counseling i know some psychologists don't recommend cbt sometimes and i i couldn't really talk to you about the different types of talking therapies but all i would say is this is incredibly practical and pragmatic and it's it, you know if you are struggling um it, it's worth a read in conjunction with everything else that you're doing which I know um there was a comment quite early on about somebody talking about the pressure to do everything that I'm always reeling off so exercise relax eat well don't drink sleep don't smoke and trying to find space to take all of that on board when you might be feeling super frazzled. That I, I think this is quite good at helping you breathe and find some space because there will be some space yeah. to do something positive, whether it's getting up early and running with the dog, which I find incredibly helpful, or it's switching off at the end of the day. You know, it's finding that bit and this can be a helpful way of doing it. Perfect. Super. Thank you, Claire. And, 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 and I suppose what people might not realize it can help with physical symptoms as well as mm. psychological symptoms. And, yes. and that is key. So that concludes our session for this evening. I think the time has flown by. Um, huge thank you to Dr. Claire, to Kate and to Deborah. Um, the, and now I'll hand over to Claire and Claire will do a quick recap on what will happen next. Thank you. Sure. Wow. Thank you so much. It was so interesting um, and uh, yeah, really informative. Feels like there's so much more that we could get into, but um, time doesn't allow. Uh, so once again, a reminder that this event uh, was recorded and a link will be emailed to all of those who registered this evening, along with links to other resources. It will also be available to view on the Rest Best YouTube channel, uh, as well as within our menopause section. Uh, if you haven't seen our other menopause events, uh, you can also find them here too. So thank you so much to our partners, My Menopause Centre, uh, to the amazing panel, and of course, to all of our members uh, and to everyone else for joining and for all the amazing questions and comments. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evenings and good night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.